we'll start with introductions, etc. So welcome to Digging Deep to our monthly webinar. As uh, some of you may know, because I've joined before, we do this at the end of the month. Sometimes it's just a discussion with guests. Sometimes we present something. And today we're really excited to have Paul Lawton with, with us here. Um, this is going to be a discussion back and forth. We're also going to take questions. So in your screen, you can see like a Q&A there. Just type in there or type into the chat if you have questions, and then we'll get to them in between if we can, and otherwise at the end. Um, we will also be recording this because we have a bunch of people that wanted the recording because they couldn't partake today, maybe because of holidays that have just started. And so we are recording this as well, and we'll be sending the link through so that everybody that maybe wants to revisit something can as well. So my name is Rosemary. I'm the project manager for Digging Deep, and I'm also the producer for Shadow's Edge, our self-help mobile game. And as you may know, all of our topics are revolve around um, mental health and helping people, specifically young people, through what they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And as part of that, um, also we help young people deal with chronic illnesses. And this is part of why I'm really excited that Paul is here, because Paul is a cancer survivor, he's an actor and producer, and he also created the sketch comedy show ChannelSurfingStudios.com. And we'll have the links to his web, his website, and also the the um, channel uh, channel studio there um, later on, so that you can have a look at those. So, Paul, do you want to just give us a, a little bit of an intro? You know, uh, a little bit more than what I just said about who you are, where you came from, you know, where you live, that kind of stuff. You got it. Thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Loudon, originally from San Diego. Uh, here living in Los Angeles, making silly videos for everyone. Uh, and as Rosemary mentioned, I uh, went through stage four cancer. Um, and that clearly is one of the highlights. Uh, but of course, we're going to talk about how I got through it using humor. Uh, that's what I've been doing my whole life. Writing jokes, making jokes, being silly. Not just as an adult or career, but even as a child. So it's something that's been going on throughout my entire life from the very beginning. And so how did it all get started? If you say, you know, you've been doing it all of your life, or do you have like an early memory of when you, when you used humor to cope? And, you know, how did you get started on, on really doing this laughter got me through it type of, of trainings and sketches and things that you do? I think my earliest memory is when I was nine. I uh, had a disability at the time. Essentially, my hip and my leg were not connected properly, so I had to get it reconnected. So I spent my ninth birthday in the hospital, and I noticed how everyone was stressed and nervous and uncomfortable. And then when I made jokes or I acted silly, uh, kind of lightened it up, and everything got better. I even remember uh, it was late at night when the nurses came in, and uh, she said, how's everything going? And I just remember that like I put my arm like this, and I said, everything's great, but I can't seem to find my arm. You know, it's, it was just so silly, and the nurse laughed, because obviously, my, I'm misplacing my arm, you know, isn't the diagnosis or wasn't the situation. So that was the first memory. Even the nurses lightened up and, and had some fun. So nine years old was the first time I recognized the power of humor. And then you were diagnosed with, with cancer. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, what that was like, what you went through at the beginning and how you then uh, found comedy through that again, you know, during, during your journey? Yeah, in 2007, I was diagnosed with stage four non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a form of blood cancer. And just like most people, when you have something that's uh, very intense, how you handle it, can make it that much easier and much more challenging. And I did simply the same thing. Uh, even when I was in the hospital, they would say, how's it going here? And I would say, oh, it's fine. I'm, you know, I'm just taking a little vacation here in Hotel Santa Monica, UCLA Santa Monica, got a nice view. I think I might stay for a few more days and then head back home. So everything that was going on, I was putting into a form of humor, uh, even if it's not a specific joke with a setup and a punchline, but really just my way of handling it, allowing the other people around me also to not feel so stressed from what I'm going through. Because when you have a, 
traumatic situation, it affects your bubble, the people in your bubble. So how can I make myself feel better and the people in my bubble? And that's kind of by lighting it up with jokes and humor and silliness. And so what effect did it have on you to, to make these jokes or, you know, to lighten it up? Was it something that you just mainly started for others or was it also, you know, helping you specifically get, get through tougher days, if you will? Absolutely. I noticed that a lot of people get really down and it's normal to feel down or frustrated or have any negative emotions. But for me, the way I express myself and get it out there for myself and find a solution and also just get it off my chest. Sometimes it's just good to hear your own frustrations. It was like an immediate therapy. I get this information or I'm feeling this way. I deal with it with humor. It's very therapeutic for me. And so once you were through with, with the cancer and you luckily you're here, you're in remission, um, what then made you choose comedy and stand-up comedy? Because yes, laugh, laughter can get you through a lot of things, but why turn that into a career? What got you to that part? Well, the truth was I was doing it already before and it's what I love doing and it's what gives me uh, vibrance and energy. So I jumped right into it. In fact, the first live show I did, I produced it, I wrote the sketches. I didn't have enough energy to be in every single sketch. So I organized it so I could do one sketch and then rest and one sketch and rest. And I gave myself characters that would not have to talk too much. And that ultimately kind of developed my style of characters that don't talk a lot, do a lot of silly physical comedy, maybe a less silly or ridiculous like a Mr. Bean or Charlie Chaplin who are my favorites. So I was doing that before, and that's what gave me this energy, this life force. And being in the hospital, I thought about, okay, when I get out, I can do this, this, and this. And even before I got out, knowing that I could do those things, the things that I love, gave me energy, gave me a purpose, and gave me a goal. And then I jumped right into it with even more love. So at Digging Deep, we talk a lot about self-expression. And of course, comedy is also an art form and it's, it's part of self-expression. Did you use your journey with cancer also in your sketches? And if so, you know, did, ha, did that help you process what was happening to you? Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your emotional process as you use humor and, and, and how you use vice versa, your illness in your comedy? Yeah, well, it's interesting because my sketches, I didn't use any of my experiences going through cancer, but in my public speaking, it was primarily on that. So what I did was I used my sketches and making sketches, performing live or producing them as a way to just, I was gonna use the word digging deep, because uh, when you dig deep into something, you're in the middle of it and nothing else that's surrounding you affects you. So it's that idea of when you're doing something you love and you look up and eight hours are gone, you're really into it. You're just loving it. You're just having a blast. You're having a wonderful time. So the sketches I made were a way of focusing on what I love and not having to deal with all those other challenges that I may be feeling or experiencing. However, on the other hand, people asked me to speak at their events, whether it be uh, cancer fundraisers or other types of issues. And I found that when I did that, it was primarily on my experience. And from that, uh, continued success uh, at those events. And what I mean by continued success is that one, the, the audience responded positively because the story came from a place of honesty and experience. Two, because of my previous background of five years doing stand up comedy, there was a different response from the crowd. They were able to see the challenges and the suffering, but yet laugh at it at the same time. And it was very different because most people share their stories. And it is a bit tough and it's hard and it's emotional. So mine had this push and pull. I'm talking about these challenging things, but people are laughing. Uh, so in sketch, not as much. In fact, it was kind of my escape if in a good way, my therapy. But in public speaking, it was my sole focus. So that way I can give all my attention to it, deal with my own uh, challenges and experience and share them with others to hopefully 
touch, motivate, and inspire them. So you create your own sketches, you say. What's, what's the process? Where do your ideas come from? And how do you then turn those into sketches and into a stand-up comedies? Yeah, well, sketches for me come from a variety of places. I'll give an example. One of the videos is called Customer Service. Uh, and in this video, the waiter does everything for you, which would be above and beyond what you would ever experience. Uh, I don't want to give it away, but let's just say at one point, the waiter chews the food for you. It's a comedy. It's extreme. Some people say it's gross out. I just think it's silly. Uh, so that came from an experience of living in Eastern Europe, where, how shall we say, sometimes the customer service is a little less than friendly, a little bit strong, maybe a little bit uh, abrupt for American people. So I took that slightly uh, strong customer service and I took it to the opposite extreme and I put a real person in an exaggerated situation where it's normal to get a massage while you're having your soup. So that's where it comes from. And then the stand-up, I take directly from my experience. And I, I don't know if I call it stand-up. What I do is I call it my routine because stand-up comedians, ooh, it's a whole different life. Going to the clubs, traveling, uh, and I did that for five years. So this is more of a routine and it's uh, dedicated to my experience of cancer recovery. And with that, it's actually in a folder. And when I recovered, I started journaling. And I would journal and write all these things and then I'd look at it and I think, oh, that's a funny joke. And I would highlight it, rip it out of the notebook, put it in the folder. Then I'd journal more and I think, oh, this would be a funny thing to say or interesting to share. If I was asked to work at a fundraiser, rip it out. And now I have three or four folders because I kept getting full. And now I'm opening those folders and trying to put them in a structure uh, and figuring out how to tell the story from beginning to end without, without it being too long but also with those jokes in there and being detailed without living, leaving out anything because I don't want to leave something out because it doesn't have a funny punchline. So that's how, those are the two different uh, structures or uh, ways of going about to create either sketch or my routine. You say that you, you, uh, you were writing a lot and you were writing in your journal. That's something that we at Digging Deep believe very strongly in. You know, if you, if you write your story several times, you start telling it a little bit mm -hmm. different every time you do that. And that is because you are starting to accept and incorporate what is happening to you into, um, into your life and into going forward. How did, you, how did you feel with that when you started? What, why did you, first of all, why did you start um, journaling when you were going into recovery and not earlier perhaps and how did it help you did it help you you know realize those things and realize things about yourself yeah similar answer to before I've always been journaling I've always been writing uh, sometimes I'll open a notebook and read this and think wait a minute I wrote this oh yeah that was 10 years ago uh, to a point where <clears throat> I spent months going through my bookshelf which was all journals I'm not exaggerating to say there were about a hundred. And that was after I had already done a, a house cleaning from before to the point where I had to divide them. I had journals that were humor, journals that were more focused on recovery, some that were just rambling, some that were sketch ideas or movie ideas. So I had four shelves and I ended up putting on each of those shelves and then the top. So I've been journaling, journaling a long time and so when I got out of the hospital and I started to going through my recovery, it was a natural instinct because, well, first of all, I had like 15 to 20 empty little notebooks because every time I go to the 99 cent store, I grab two or three. I grab two or three and sometimes I start a new one and an old one. In fact, if you can see, I'm looking right here. I have three that are still in the plastic that I just got two days ago. If I see it, I take it because having it with me I keep one in my glove compartment. I keep one in my bag. I have one in the trunk of my car. I have one next to my bed. Uh, there's one in my, my office, which is my living room. Uh, <clears throat> because you just never know what's gonna come to your mind. And I grab it and I write it. And I use the word therapeutic. Of course, it's extremely therapeutic to get your words out there, get your thoughts out there. And you never know what that material 
might generate. You never know what you're writing could become not only for you, but for other people as well. Yeah, that's a good point too. I mean, if you, if you look at what writing can become for yourself as well, as you say, you, you go back and you look through those, those journals. I would venture that not many people do that. A lot of people think, you know, about journaling as just being cathartic. Mm -hmm. um, but I like what you said about being able to really revisit some of those things. And, and I would assume that also when you do go back, you see how your tastes have changed, how your life has changed, how your thoughts have changed. And you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's very fun. In fact, when I get a full notebook, uh, I actually go through it before I put it onto the shelf. Because what happens, and it's super messy, there, there is a method to the madness. I'll find things like, oh, these are short story ideas. And I rip them out. And then I put them in the folder, like old school hard copy, you know? And then, oh, these are really funny jokes that I could uh, use to share my experience of going through cancer. I ripped those out. Then I put them on the, on the shelf. And then I do that with the next one and the next one. And then it builds up. <clears throat> I go back and look at them and I, I, I read things that I totally forgot. And it's funny because I'll open and I'll read something and think, how could I have not use that in my routine it's like this might be like the top three most important things but did my mind block it out did i go somewhere into my sketches and my work that i just completely forgot about it who knows but the cool thing is i read it and immediately it's like a flood and i remember everything <clears throat> and what's really great is that on one hand, it allows me the opportunity to look at it and think, hmm, why did my brain forget that? Was that intentional and I was hiding it and I didn't want to deal with it? Or had I dealt with it and like, oh, cool, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, it was difficult. Moving on. Uh, and it's a constant self-evaluation, uh, self-improvement. Um, I mean, I, I got to say, for a dollar notebook from the 99 cent store so incredibly helpful i just think about cost effectiveness you know for a dollar to write or you spend all this money on these other things which yes they have value but i think for the the small cost for the greatest value a notebook a notebook and, and you you take it to the extreme in a way, right? Not only do you write a lot as as far as you know, journaling goes, but also you then talk about that publicly. And sometimes yeah. it can be really scary to put yourself out there. We we're trying to get our young people in the game to to really communicate with others, you know, in a safe environment and feel free to like vent and let things out there. Um, but I can imagine it must be even scarier by now, maybe not anymore, but it must be even scarier to do that on stage and, and to really bring such personal context into what you do. How, how does that make you feel? And, and, and what do you learn from that? Well, here's something interesting and it's not, uh, it's not a pushback from what you're saying. It's not a disagreement. It's a different perspective in a sense that keeping everything inside and not sharing for me is the scariest thing. That was my, if I could go back, I don't want to live in a regret. I'm not a type of person that lives in regret. I'm very nostalgic, but uh, if I looked back through my entire experience for a five year period, that's for the difficult part. And of course, when you have a traumatic incident or challenges, there's still those ripple effects. Having cancer or some major trauma in your life, whether it's health or otherwise, it's like a big stone that you throw into a little pond. You got that initial splash and you don't know what's going on, but those ripples keep going, keep going. And <clears throat> when I look back, the thing I wish I had done more was express myself. Instead, I kept things to myself. Uh, I didn't want anybody else to feel sad or worried or concerned. And by not expressing myself as much as I should have, I felt more nervous and more afraid or more concerned. And that to me was scary. Getting up on a stage is the opposite for me. It's freeing. It's, there's a sense of freedom because people want to hear this story. I want to share it. They're enjoying 
my honesty. And for me, that actually has been the most uh, exciting part and the least scary of all the things. Yeah, you might say a joke and it doesn't work, but you know, you, look, you have a favorite group and they come out with a, a, a new album or CD or whatever and they have 12 songs, three or four are your favorite, two or three you like, the other is not so much. You know, I make 10 jokes, similar ratio. And so there's not really a fear that the joke is gonna bomb. It's more that, okay, I'm expressing myself from a place of honesty. I have a background in humor and storytelling. So I know at the very least people will be entertained and enjoy it and get some laughs along the way, as well as being able to connect to it if people in the audience have been impacted by some type of experience or traumatic experience. That's very helpful. So for, for our young people, um, what would you give them as like a very basic tip of how they can take that little bit of fear away? Is there any like routine or something that you do when you do feel nervous or is there any tips you can give them both for, for starting to journal, but also for putting themselves out there with other people, be that online, be that, you know, in groups or with their family, whatever they're going through. Absolutely. And when I share this with people, cause I do actually uh, work with children, teaching them comedy, uh, and it sounds counterproductive. And when I first introduced the idea, I introduced it more lightly, you know? It's like when you put your, your medicine in a little uh, bologna for the dog or something, you know? Uh, I just kind of slide the information in there, but what it I is- I fly with my dog anymore. He just totally gets that. that too smart, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, then you, we, I gotta find new ways, right? To mix it in there with something else, uh, make a little doggy milkshake. So what I do, uh, and again, it sounds counterproductive, is you make a list of all the things that are difficult for you, challenging, frustrating. And people think, how can I make jokes about difficulties and struggles and failures and uh, all these negative things? Well, that's where the humor comes out of. That's where the honesty comes out of. And you're, I, you'd be surprised, and I found this to be true with every single time that I did this, when I opened up and I shared my story with or without a humor or in front of an audience, just in general, the response was always positive. Uh, people appreciated that I shared so openly because um, most people hold back and it's very damaging, I believe. And so when I express myself, whether it's in front of a crowd or with friends or family, they were really uh, taken and they were really appreciative that I shared with them. In fact, most of them didn't even know that what I had gone through. So think about that. You experience something, you don't really share it with the people close to you and they're there to support you, they love you, but then you're not really being yourself. So who are they supporting? A version of yourself, you know? So I found the, the more open I am the more genuinely honest, even about the most difficult, painful things, everybody gets to know who I really am. And that's an amazing feeling to be your true self, to recognize who has that unconditional love for you. And some people have the concern, well, what if people don't like it, they're uncomfortable, blah, blah, blah. well, they can leave and the cool people can stay. The people who love you, who want to be there for you, they can stay. And it's much more fun to be with people you like and people you love. So it can only, in my opinion, it can only benefit you. That's great. And you do, as you mentioned, you run workshops to teach people how to use comedy to not only just become, a, you know, make jokes and, and write those sketches or, or do comedy, but also really to use it for healing. Can you talk a little bit about those workshops and how they work and, you know, what can people expect to learn? How do you run those? And we do have an audience question. So after that, we'll, we'll get to the audience question. Okay, cool. So when I look at working, specifically I work with kids, uh, we call it stand-up class, but really what it is, it's more self-expression. Each of the kids has a different background. 
uh, different personality. So someone who's a little bit shy may be doing the class because they want to develop uh, their speaking skill with others. Someone else may be very silly and funny and not shy at all, but they ramble on and they, they talk and people have trouble following them, so we pull that in. So it's more of a self-expression course. And you know most people aren't gonna go into being a professional stand-up comedian. But you can use humor in every single aspect of your life and regardless of where you're at. And to learn the tools and what, what skills that you naturally have and what you can develop is very uh, energizing. When you see a 10 year old kid who's got his headphones on in the Zoom and he's in his chair and he's kind of like this, and then seven weeks later, he's doing this. So my favorite YouTube video is Stampy Cat, you know, and he's vibrant and, uh, and excited and thrilled. And I even said to one of, the, one of the kids I was working with, I said, man, you gotta have your own YouTube channel because you're awesome. And, and he said, oh, I've always thought that, but I never said it. Well, I'm saying it for you. Now you just said it, go do it, you know? Uh, so it's really, a, a, it's an amazing experience that people have when they work uh, on humor through their challenges. And that's what most comedians do. They, they deal with the challenges they've had in life and they put it in a funny way and it's an honest way. And I always tell people, look at your favorite comedians. What are they talking about? Generally, their lives, their difficulties, how they handled it with humor and got through the other side. So we have a great question um, from Terry here who asks, do you ever have your humor misinterpreted and get an angry response from your audience? And if so, follow up question, how do you <laughs> handle that? Do you ever have like hecklers, for example, and how do you handle those? Yeah, well, as I mentioned, I, uh, I do a routine rather than stand up. Yes, when I, when I did stand up, you know, I'm just doing regular jokes. Yeah, there are people who are hecklers and, and being silly, but uh, now, most of the audience I have are there specifically for an event, cancer fundraiser, awareness, uh, different type of uh, organization. So people generally, I have yet to have any negative responses. What I can say is, as I mentioned before, when you're coming from a place of honesty uh, and you're sharing, it's hard to be critical of someone who's gone through such traumatic experiences and they're pouring their heart out to you and you're laughing at the same time. Uh, no one has been critical or found the, the humor that I was expressing off-putting. Uh, well, first of all, I don't use any bad language. I don't, I'm not an edgy. Uh, if you watch my sketches, they're, they're not edgy. They're just silly, like Mr. Bean, Chaplin. Uh, my last screening had 350 people and there were about 50 kids there. Uh, because I have some sketches where there's the pie in the face or, you know, silly stuff. So my humor isn't that edgy or politically motivated. Uh, I don't use any bad language just because that's who I am. So I haven't experienced that yet. Now, if someone did have some kind of negative reaction, it probably speaks to what they're feeling. It's not that I hurt their feelings or I attack them they resonated with something I was saying and they were feeling emotional about it because they, they, they have that similar experience and they never had, they didn't talk about it. They never had that opportunity to share. And so I have had a few people who'd say, yeah, you were talking about this. And then we start having a conversation and then eventually they let it out. So any negative reaction is not be because of what I said offended them, but because they connected to it and they, it landed on them in such a way that it brought up hurt feelings, uh, hurt, difficult experiences. And then we talked and they felt better, just like I feel better when I'm sharing. 
And I think maybe it's also you, you're doing a slightly different type of routine if you are up there, right? You are, yeah. you are talking about, you know, emotions and healing and, and the humor side of actually going through that. Um, if you take more standard, let's say, um, standard stand-up comedy, if you will, then a lot of the times I believe also the heckling sometimes is wanted because it's sort of like a, a challenge and it brings more interaction into it. Just like, you know, we really welcome questions because it brings mm -hmm. more interaction. And I think maybe that's a that's a good way to see some of those things where you're just testing out your material and people will have reactions to it and it just makes it more interactive. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very true. I know that uh, when I've done my routine, not the stand-up in the past, when I've done my routine, very often I spend the majority of the time after talking with the people who have listened to it. Now, these events are cancer fundraisers, so it doesn't feel like a stand-up comedy show where there's kind of a green light where the audience can have more interactive. But generally, I walk off the stage, and there are people waiting for me just to talk and just to hang out. Uh, a majority of the time, people will say, my cousin, my brother, my husband, wife, whomever, uh, had this or went through this experience. Thank you so much for sharing. And then they talk about how they feel. Um, and it's funny because there are times when I'll finish and I'll hop off the stage and I think, oh gosh, what do I do now? I don't have anything to do. And then I look over, there's a line of people. Some of them just want to hug. Because, and oftentimes they'll say, thank you for expressing what I've been keeping inside. Mm -hmm. So, Heckler's not yet. Maybe uh, when that, uh, it's, a, it's a little different. But again, stand-up comedians are uh, a unique and special talent. And when I did do stand-up, and most every comedian has to be prepared for that, you have a series of responses. Some comedians thrive on that. Others want to diffuse it and, and focus on their material, which is what I did. Uh, but that's part of your job is to entertain and to be in charge. So if somebody starts heckling, you have to take control of it and move on. And you know, we have certain responses memorized, depending on what they say, we have a list, a mental list of how to handle it. Uh, so do you think that would be something helpful also, let's say if somebody's just starting out trying to express themselves, not just with comedy, but also in, 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 in life in general, you know, if there are certain things that they don't want to talk about or that they think might be difficult, that they just journal about that and, and, and create some of those, if you say, you know, responses that roads that they could take if it happens. So do you think that would be helpful? Oh, absolutely. Again, when I write, I mean, I have four folders that are stacked. Some of the stuff I probably won't share to an audience because, first of all, I've already handled it. I've moved on. Secondly, it might not be entertaining. Thirdly, it might be too personal mm -hmm. and I don't want to share it. Now there's a difference between being honest and too personal. If it's something that you don't feel comfortable sharing, then you just don't. Uh, there are certain things that may be difficult for an audience to handle because it might be uh, a bit heavy. So, you know, I can lighten it up or just not not share it at all. So it's a personal choice. For me, I'm kind of an open book. Uh, and that's part of the reason why when I am asked to speak at these functions, I receive such a, a positive response because there is a vulnerability there. And that vulnerability allows for other people to absorb your experiences and what you're feeling. So maybe, again, that's why there haven't been any hecklers or there hasn't been any real negative responses because that honesty, especially an honesty that comes from an incredibly difficult place, uh, is extremely appreciated, whether it's in front of an audience or for friends. Uh, I will share something. Uh, I was talking with a group of people and someone said, oh, Paul, uh, you had cancer and da-da-da-da, and they just asked the question completely open with no hesitation. And I appreciated that this person didn't have any discomfort. And I answered openly and everyone was shocked at how the difficulty that I experienced. Uh, and they were so thankful. And they saw me in a whole new light uh, because I kept most of this stuff to myself. So it was just me. But then when people see that I experienced this and this and this, 
and this is how I got through. I did these classes, I did this therapy, I did uh, this physical exercise, I did this, and I had these struggles, and I got through it, got through it. And it's, again, to use the phrase I mentioned before, which is very appropriate, because I use the word digging deeper. You know, when you dig deeper, you find more, and then you dig deeper and you find more, and you keep going, and it builds this wealth, and it makes me think of one of the passages from Khalil, uh, Khalil Gibran. I don't know exactly, and I'll summarize. Uh, someone um, asks him, Khalil Gibran, as he's leaving the ship, they ask him, uh, what is joy and what is pain? And uh, he says, they are essentially the same thing. They are a stick. And only when you dig out a hole with the pain can you fill it with joy. And for people who've gone through these traumatic experiences, there's a lot of digging. And we, the goal is to get a lot of filling because then you are a full, rich person. And when you have those experiences to share, whether it be in your small circle, a big circle in front of a crowd, it's fantastic. We had um, Ellen raise her hand. So if we do oh, yes. dive questions, we'll do that at the end, if that's okay. We'll leave a few minutes. Um, sure. Otherwise, obviously, you know, if there's questions we can just read from the chat, then we'll, we'll take it immediately. Um, if, I'm in quarantine. I'm not going anywhere. So <laughs> <laughs> we can do eight hours. Eight hours good for everyone. Yes. Okay. Good. Let's keep going. It's a long <laughs> uh, some people can say that humor can be an avoidance tactic. What's your stance on that? Absolutely. In fact, I did use that, and I had to learn within myself: Am I avoiding these issues by making a joke and pushing it away so I don't have to handle it? Or have I handled it, and because I'm okay with it, then I can make a joke? And that's a personal discovery. What I did recognize was situations where people were sharing and being open, uh, and they wanted to know about my feelings, and I deflected it with some jokes. Not healthy. It didn't help me. And the people around me, they don't get to know who I am. So they get Paul Light instead of like a rich fullness of who I am, the, the total of sum of me. So yes, I have done that. I'm guilty of that. And a lot of people work in humor. Uh, there is a, there's a fine line, you know? For me now, I don't deflect. If I'm in a situation where I don't feel it's the right time to talk about it, what I say to the person is, oh, I'd love to share and chat about it. Right now may not work for me, but I'd love to either set up a time or another location uh, where we can. Mm -hmm. And then that way I'm not avoiding it. I'm just putting it off till another time. Um, and writing about my situation, writing about my life and my challenges and fears and worries and concerns, and then putting them into a joke. It's not avoidance, it's acceptance. And then taking it to a whole nother level. I've accepted it and I'm sharing it. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's actually a great tip, I think, also for our young people. And, and obviously, your illness journey has influenced your work. Do you have any other influences that help you, you know, create and, and, uh, and bring out your inner writer, if you will, or your, your inner peace? You know, I find that, uh, as strange as it sounds, uh, I just listen to other people. And what that does for me really gives me an insight to myself and to other people's ideas. Um, some of my greatest successes have been through a conversation. I share something and the person starts telling me things and I listen and I listen and then I sleep on it and then it comes to my mind and then I modify it. Uh, some of my most popular sketches are not even my ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, my, I would say right now, uh, my most popular sketch is Mr. Velcro. He's a manager in office who sticks to people. I don't want to give it away, but there's an underlying current about it that is related to uh, healing. But that wasn't even my idea. I had a regular job and a woman who worked there says, I got a funny idea for you. And she just says, you know, just like that. Or, uh, or Mr. Velcro was uh, originally created by a friend, uh, my friend JJ. And then I told people, and then this woman says, oh, he could do this and that and this. 
and then it was done, just like that. So I found that listening to people, getting their ideas, uh, is really uh, transformative for me in a sense that I have a certain amount of knowledge and experience, and I do believe there are things like tucked away inside my brain that pop out every once in a while, but having it stimulated and uh, open through other people has really been the key for me. Nice. And we talked a lot about laughter and healing. What other benefits do you see that, you know, comedy can bring? Why would somebody do like a comedy class? What's, uh, what's in it for them? Yeah, as I mentioned before, being able to use humor in any situation is great. People love to laugh. They love to smile. And if you notice some of the most challenging times, if you're able to get through it and smile, like the expression, if I don't laugh, I'll cry. Well, I, I kind of modify that. I say, it's okay to do both. You cry, you get it out. Then you can laugh and get through it. Um, humor works in every form, uh, in every environment, especially with self-expression. You'll watch a film or a TV show and there's an amazing point behind it, but you're laughing the whole time. And I feel like you're able to take in that idea and those concepts more easily, whereas if it's heavy and driven in and dramatic, you might feel emotionally overwhelmed and exhausted, whereas when you're laughing and having fun, you, have, you feel good, and then the message that was presented to you becomes part of you. So humor in every walk of life is a positive. Yeah, I think so too. And I did a, a comedy class in Los Angeles once and I'm never going to do anything with it. Um, not funny <laughs> enough. But the, the, what I liked about it is that I felt more confident afterwards, even though, you know, what the, the process for me sucked because it was totally out of my comfort zone. Yeah. Um, but just, just to be able, you know, to formulate things slightly different, uh, it just gave me a lot of confidence as well, I think. Yeah, those classes are great. And most people, who do classes don't want to be stand-up comedians. They just want to learn about jokes and structure. And I even tell uh, actors, uh, people who have regular jobs, you know, uh, or as, as I call them, people who have real jobs. Uh, take the class, learn. I mean, yeah, it's very uncomfortable to stand in front of a room and share. It's, and it's only you. If you're in a play or a sketch or it's a team, you know, you can deflect. Uh, but when you're up there, it's just you. You're on that little island, which is why everyone says, oh, stand-up is so scary and so hard. And it is. It is. But for me, it's the opposite. It's a comfort zone. The exact opposite. Because when I get up there, I think, uh, it's just me and everyone here. And I can be myself and I'm going to share and let's have this experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I tell people, yeah, do the class. Uh, take some courses, learn about humor, apply it in everyday life, even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging, even if you're totally out of your comfort zone, because when you're out of your comfort zone, it means you're learning something new, uh, which is great, uh, just like you did. And I'm sure you apply it in different aspects of your life and it's fun. Yeah, it is. And, and um, so I'm picking this up because we have an audience, also somebody that says, you know, it, that um, they're an introvert and the profession actually requires to be an extrovert. And that's part of, part of why I did it. So I've been in, in sales and very boring jobs for, for a long time in my life. And I've always wanted to do more creative writing. And that step to really do that, um, I just needed to get out of my comfort zone to do yeah. something and the nice thing I, I found about, you know, doing a comedy class, I, I also, I'm, I'm with you all the way. I would say to anybody, just do it because it's, it's two days. What can happen, you know, in those two days? Well, it's not going to end if you're up there and if you get booed out or heckled or whatever it is. It just, it gets you to know yourself in a different way, a different light. You'll be proud of yourself for doing something, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a bit like bungee jumping, which totally never ever 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 going to do again wouldn't recommend it to anybody either but you know my 72 year old mother did it so i kind of had to um but it, it, i think it's just you know, the, putting yourself out there at the beginning can can feel strange but the more you do it the more it becomes routine right um and you learn what works for you and what work what doesn't work for you and i i think that's also paul what you said a lot a lot now 
um, that the more you did it, the more freeing it became and the more helpful for yourself it became. And I think that's something that's really important. So yes, to our audience member, I would definitely try a class. There are even classes that just take like, you know, an evening, just sort of like a, a mini a mini view into it. Also, Paul runs workshops, um, how to do things with comedy. It's not, te not technically stand-up comedy, but you know, how to use comedy, how to formulate things, how to put yourself out there a little bit more. We'll give the link to that also after the after the webinar. We'll send around some resources as well. You know, um, uh, interesting. I didn't want to respond. Is that there's a secret? Uh, a lot of comedians and actors are introverts, yeah. and they use performing as a way of expressing themselves. And you'll notice, you know, some of them are extroverts. They go on talk shows and they're super funny, and then you see this amazing, brilliant actor, and they go up there. And it's an awkward interview and you know they don't know how to and it's and uh, and it's there's all these weird pauses because those people are not comfortable at the party talking with people and chatting but their form of expression is getting on that stage and telling those jokes or getting into that film or on that stage so you, with my years of doing this you would be absolutely surprised how many people you see on that stage just being energetic and electric and strong and they get off stage and they just go home and chill out by themselves because they don't need, they don't have that desire, they don't have that personality to go and chat with everyone. So that's one of the things that I really found interesting working with people up on the stage. My gosh, this person's amazing. And then after they just sit and talk and there's, Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going home now. Okay, see you. Bye. Oh, you don't need to be with all these people and chat and interact. You know, so it's fascinating. And then there are people, what is it, introvert, extrovert, extrovert, introvert. I still, you know, you, you can mix them. I'm a person that gets, uh, gets excited to be with people and I get ideas and it's fun and I get amped up and have a wonderful time. And then I absolutely celebrate and enjoy my alone time so I can fluctuate between the two so introvert or extrovert both both types of people can do great with humor mm -hmm. performing acting whatever it might be yeah and I'm 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 your opposite I, uh, I I know it doesn't sound like it because I do these moderations I do a lot of you know public speaking and interviews and stuff like that and I put myself out there in blogs and writing but no, I'm, I'm most happy when I, when I can write in a dark corner with nobody there. <laughs> so I'm, Maybe I'm, the your dog. <laughs> your dog. I'm one of those people that immediately after stage wants to go home. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, um, let's, uh, I, I have a little challenge for you as well. Okay. So you've seen our game shadow's edge and obviously yeah. there's no humor as such in there. The gardens do make one or two remarks, but the point of the, the game obviously is, is self-expression, right? And getting people to be real, to be authentic, to be yourself. I wonder if, um, you know, how you can see a game like that, maybe also helping people uh, through their journey and, and, uh, and, and maybe how they can like use that journaling that they do in the game to infuse their humor and, and dealing with their laughter. Okay, yeah. So when I thought about that is, because a lot of people are expressing themselves and putting information out there and really opening up, which is, as I mentioned, the key to, first of all, self-expression, but secondly, to creating a joke. So <clears throat> one technique you do is you start sharing yourself and what you're doing and what you're experiencing here, and then you come in with a surprise there. And that's the joke. You mislead the audience that you're going to go in one direction, and then you throw in something as a surprise at the end. So if you look at uh, your list about yourself and all the challenges and difficulties, and you start to put sentences together of what you've gone through and how you've uh, handled these experiences, and then you try to put a little surprise or twist or punchline. And I always go like this because it's misleading the people, and then you go like this, like a magician. Magician goes here, and they're doing something here, and that's what comedians are doing. They're leading you this direction, and suddenly, whoop, and that's where the jokes go. So within the, the structure of the game, for people who are laying out uh, some of their ideas and their thoughts and journaling, 
to think about at the end, how can they put something in there that the reader wouldn't expect that might be light or silly or funny? And that's a, a technique that I think could be applied to the game. I think it's a, that's a, 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 great, um, a great tip. And I think that's also something that could then really work with Shadowgram where that's then what they put out there, right? There, mm -hmm. that, that surprise. So that's a, and yeah, it's a really cool insight. And then also if you had a sketch about like the city of Shadow's Edge and the Guardians, what would it be? This, again, this is cut offhanded, of course, I'm throwing you on the spot here, but. Yeah. You know. Well, again, uh, it has to do with people expressing themselves, right? So if they were, the sketch could be like a self-help group where everyone's telling these seriously heavy things and then boom, they all make a joke, but they don't know if they can laugh or not because this is a serious group. For example, people go to different recovery groups there's lots of laughter, uh, but people from the outside might think, oh, it's very serious, you're gonna go there. Well, have a good time with your class. And they use a soft voice. I hope everything goes okay. But they don't realize that it can get really raucous and silly and funny uh, because people are so open. You, you have that intimacy uh, and it's private, you know, only within that group. So if you had a sketch where a new person came in and didn't know it's okay to be funny, and either they're laughing and everybody else is not laughing intentionally just to have fun with them or the other way around. So having it be a surprise, you're going into this serious group and it's funny, or you're being funny, but everyone else is being serious. So there's that awkward juxtaposition of, of the situation. All right, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so last question and then we'll see if there's other questions maybe from the audience and i know that somebody had put up i think ellen put up the hand so we'll we'll open it up also to live questions okay. um what's your favorite comedian and why specifically is that your favorite yeah that's one of those uh questions that's super hard to answer uh in a good way because there are so many great ones uh one comedian may have really great physical humor one comedian does great impressions. Another one tells wonderful stories. Um, and for me, other people like I mentioned before, Mr. Bean and Charlie Chaplin, because they express themselves through their faces. Uh, then you'll have a comedian like Stephen Wright, who's very dry and says these absurd jokes, which always catch you in as, as a surprise. Um, so when people, are looking toward comedians um, who they're interested in. I say, watch all of them. And if it resonates with you, it's because their story is similar. What I do is every couple of days, I Google a different comedian and I watch them. So yesterday I was watching Louis Anderson. He's been a comedian for, gosh, maybe 40 years, 50. Uh, he's been on, he's, been on several shows. He has, I think, two shows on now, an animated show and another show, I think, uh, Baskets he's on. His stand-up <clears throat> is amazing. And one of the early routines, way back when, which I watched yesterday on Johnny Carson, was him talking about growing up with an abusive father. And the audience was roaring with laughter. He's talking about how he was one of 11 children and the, the way for the dad to control the children was just by lifting up a gun and putting it down. And the way he delivered it was amazing and funny. And he's also very silly looking. He's got this perfectly circle head. He looks like a, an animated cartoon. He's got these cute little space teeth. And he talks like this all the time. And then my dad would say, and then he goes through this. And it's really fascinating because as we were talking about earlier, <clears throat> making a list of all the challenging things you've gone through and that becomes your routine this was what 80s or late 70s when he was on the carson show talking about not having enough food having 11 brothers and sisters and feeling neglected and having an abusive father and the crowd is roaring and immediately his his career skyrocketed because of his honesty and his openness and his vulnerability so to say who is my favorite, oh, impossible. They're all my favorites, all the time, different days, different times, and now with the internet, 
You can type in anyone you like and enjoy, so they all have something to share. Excellent. Um, so we do have a few minutes left if somebody wants to ask a question, either throw it in the Q&A or um, you know, just uh, raise your hand if you'd like as well. And if not, I do have more, more question as raise well. Raise your virtual hand. What's, yeah, exactly. Raise, raise the virtual hand. What's, what's, your, what's your process? Like, do you have, you know, would you, I, I journal a lot too. So I try to do it in the morning first thing because I just know myself I'm a workaholic. So, you know, I won't do it until it's late. And then by definition, I'm in a worse mood than in the morning, probably because I had a tough day and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, so it becomes more of a, a, a bitch journal, <laughs> if you will. But do you have any like routine of that? Do you have any tips of how do people start journaling? Because we all know self-expression, as you said, and even with humor, it helps. But how, how do you get started? You know, that sometimes, and how do you build that habit of actually doing it? Well, there are two uh, schools of thought. One is you set up a schedule like you. I have to do it at this time and this time of the day. Uh, <clears throat> for example, Jerry Seinfeld has a specific time of day that he does a certain amount of work every day. And he's a master uh, comedian, storyteller. Uh, if anyone wants to learn how to tell a joke, just watch all of his specials and immediately you have a, a BA in comedy. <laughs> for me, it's different. Maybe that's why I have all these books around. I go solely based on inspiration. Something comes to my mind, oh, I gotta reach over and grab a book. Uh, when I say reach over and grab a book, it's never, it's again, from a place of honesty, I always have a notebook somewhere. This is my big notebook for big, I have big ideas, right? Uh, so for me, it's always about inspiration. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't write for weeks or months at a time, and then I'll sit down, something will come up, and then I sit down. For example, I had a screening and where I showed 40 minutes of my sketches and the five most popular that people absolutely loved, all uniquely different, totally unrelated, all five of them I wrote over a 30 minute period at the same time. They all came to my mind at one time. I couldn't get them down enough, you know, so I grabbed my notebook and I, okay, that's one, that's one, that's one, that's one. And those five in a period of 30 minutes after two or three months of no writing at all. So two schools of thoughts, thought, structured every day at this time or whenever the heck you want, whenever it comes to you, whenever you're inspired, figure out which one works for you. Try both. Go to the dollar store, invest $1 and go from there. <laughs> well, Paul, unfortunately, our, our time is up, but um, that was that was really awesome. A lot of insight also on self-expression, and I hadn't really realized how close comedy and self-expression is, but it makes total sense, and using mm -hmm. comedy to learn to express yourself also makes total sense to me. Um, I, I would love the next time that I'm in LA to do one of your workshops, so, you know, maybe <laughs> you, can, you can also hear to say what your website is, how people can sign up for those workshops. And I just also want to mention to everybody that there's a blog coming out about Paul's experience on Digging Deep as well. So keep an eye out for that. That'll be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, I only recently started doing these workshops and I've only been doing them on Zoom because of this situation. <laughs> uh, I haven't done them yet face to face, uh, but I have worked with kids for many, many years. Uh, but now it's all right here uh, on the internet and uh, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, sometimes it's just one person, sometimes it's three, as far as the uh, working with the routines. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Of course, when you come to Los Angeles, we will meet. Uh, we'll have a, a coffee or a drink and we'll come up with some more jokes together. <laughs> but yes, and yeah, thank you for again, uh, sharing my website, which as I mentioned before, my experiment back here of, uh, attempting to paint on a different type of backdrop, uh, channelsurfingstudios.com. And I will have another screening soon. I say soon. Usually I'd like to give specific dates, but right now it's hard to be specific about anything because my last screening event uh, was postponed, not canceled. And the event is called Comedy Crushes Cancer, where I screen my videos, share my story. Uh, and generally I spons I'm sponsored by a specific cancer organization 
and people can donate to that cancer organization. And we will be filming that next event and putting that online for those of us uh, who can't go, who don't live in Southern California. Right. Well, thank you so much for being here. And I just mm -hmm. want to point out again, it's channelsurfingstudios.com, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the blog. And if there's any other questions that pop up, I know also that can be tough sometimes to put yourself out here in live. You know, feel free to send us an email at feedback at diggingdeep.org. And we will make sure that Paul gets the questions that we answer yes. all of those questions, whether it be about comedy or about emotional healing. So we're always here. Um, and we've got a really good one coming up again, end of next month, which is all about journaling and how to journal, why to journal, how to start and, you know, where to end or not. And all those kinds of good things that have to do with building a habit of uh, really digging deep into yourself. So Paul, thank you very much. And thank you also to the audience. I do realize it, the holidays, the vacation has started. So it's really kind to still be here now that you're not just sniffing off work, but actually have to spend some free time potentially as well with us. So we really, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, as you know, all of our, our webinars will be uploaded to our YouTube channel as well. Um, and to uh, we'll publish them on the Digging Deep website, a link to it as well. So um, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in and have a good day. Thank you again for having me. Keep digging deep. <laughs> thank you so much, Paul. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, everyone. Bye-bye.